Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. Today, I'm joined once again by my good friend and faithful co-host, Dale Stenberg, and we're discussing C.S. Lewis' uh, old essay, Myth Became Fact, uh, which is ordinarily found in his book, God and the Dock, which is fairly, a fairly famous collection of Lewis essays, but is also found in various places online for those who are interested. Um, one of the things we want to do in this program is actually bring in various scholars on the work of C.S. Lewis, precisely because Lewis, uh, uh, while, while very popular in the sort of evangelical imagination, has many themes that perhaps have not been uh, significantly or sufficiently exegeted among conservative evangelicals. And so, uh, you know, Dale and I are under, operating under the conviction that there's a lot more there in Lewis than perhaps we've traditionally appreciated. And this, this, this uh, discussion serves as a good segue uh, into a broader discussion of Lewis. Uh, and with that, I'll actually uh, ask Dale to kind of start out our discussion of this essay. It's a short essay of only about five pages, but Dale is actually the one that introduced me to it. So, uh, Dale, maybe I'll throw it over to you and just ask you, you know, what, what, uh, how did this essay strike you? Maybe even how did you come to it and how did it, how did it strike you and what, what did you find significant about it? Sure. So a buddy of mine, um, uh, my buddy Justin actually mentioned this article to me a while ago. He's like, you have to read this. So I've been in this part of my life where I'm just digging back. I think you and I talked about this in the last episode. I'm digging back into as an adult who's come through, you know, various uh, struggles in my Christian life. I'm coming back to Lewis and I'm finding him a fresh well of living water. And um, for various reasons, uh, which we'll talk about. But in this uh, little article, and when we say little article, that's sort of misleading because there's so much uh, substance that's packed yeah. in and condensed into almost every uh, sentence. He is answering a friend of his named Cornelius uh, about a charge that was level against uh, C.S. Lewis about his Christianity merely relying on some old myth, uh, you know, some primitive way of thinking about the world. And of, of course, you know, if you're a modern person uh, that God is dead and uh, technology has helped us kill him, in other words. Uh, and I think uh, C.S. Lewis's arguments in here are arguments that need to be recovered if we're going to have an intellectual way to combat that, that, that charge. And I'm sure, you know, we've, we've experienced this, whether it's in our family with unbelieving family members or friends that don't believe in Christianity, just, you know, they think they use the um, sky daddy uh, yeah, you yeah. know, term, or they'll, they'll say, you know, what about the spaghetti monster God or, you know, whatever. And what Lewis is doing instead of um, maybe the most effective strategy in a boxing match is to not always lean back and try to dodge the punches, but maybe it's better to get close to the opponent so that the force of the punch becomes uh, less powerful. And I think that that's what Lewis is doing. He's leaning into the criticisms of his friend. And he's saying, you know what? I'm actually going to take what you have just, uh, you know, lobbed at me as an attack and I'm going to use it against you. I'm going to use the force of your yeah. argument against you. Yeah. Sort of like you think Christianity is built upon a, a bunch of primitivisms. Oh, well, let me tell you. <laughs> right. It's even more primitive than you thought. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, in our last conversation, uh, we mentioned archetypes and we moved down from there into hierarchies. But Lewis is really appealing to archetypes here. Uh, the archetypal structure of reality lends itself naturally to myth. And these myths uh, that have been handed down from generation to generation uh, throughout the course of human history have um, a pattern. And the pattern is um, found uh, among pagan religion, or, well, um, among pagan thought and then uh, other religions, but it's most clearly identified in the historical narrative of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think Lewis is bringing us. 
So he begins, I'll just, I'll read a little bit of how he begins and then you and I will just talk about it. How about yeah, that? absolutely. So he begins and he says, um, he says, my friend Cornelius has advanced the charge that none of us are in fact Christians at all. According to him, historic Christianity is something so barbarous that no modern man can really believe it. The moderns who claim to do so are in fact believing a modern system of thought which retains the vocabulary of Christianity and exploits the emotions inherited from it while quietly dropping its essential doctrines. Cornelius compared modern Christianity with the modern English monarchy. The forms of kingship have been retained, but the reality has been abandoned. Okay, so we have the claim here. What's the claim? The claim is that the people in modern, and Lewis is writing this in the 19th century. Um, wait, is it? Well, no, he's writing this in the 20th century. 20th Sorry. century, yeah. right. And he's saying that the modern Christians have all but done away with the essential uh, doctrines that undergird what they're saying they believe. And therefore, right. the Christians in this modern age uh, aren't actually Christians. They just sort of have you know, attach to themselves these barnacles of belief without having the substance of what it means to be a Christian. They don't, in other words, they don't believe in the thing they say they, they believe in. Right, right. And we've all encountered these sort of uh, interlocutors in life in one form or another. It doesn't have to look like his friend Cornelius. Right. Uh, it could look in, uh, it could, it could look like you know, your uncle at Thanksgiving say, oh, I have superstition. That's, you Christians just believe in superstition and it doesn't accord with reality. Yes. Or, or even like the version of Christianity that you believe um, uh, is kind of this um, uh, domesticated Christianity that's been softened as opposed to if you go actually read the Bible, it's full of sort of barbarism and the sort of this old, you know, it, it, people like to throw in sort of the Bronze Age, you know, Old Testament, right. you know, sort of mentality. And all you've done is really domesticate it to modern democratic sentiments, liberal sentiments, uh, and sort of kept a couple of things. But you're really not being honest about the, 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 the primitivism here. Um, uh, and one of the things that's really interesting, uh, I think, that Lewis does rhetorically is he kind of goes on immediately to say, um, he accuses Cor uh, Corinius of, of, of basically being uh, 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 incurious. Uh, one of the things that's, and it's kind of inverting the argument because you would expect an argument like this. Typically when this, when this charge is levied, you sort of see somebody say, well, Christianity is all primitive and based upon all these barbarisms. And the apologist sort of swoops in and says, oh, no, it's not. Here's all my proofs that it's not based upon barbarism. But Lewis does something more interesting. He actually, again, like he's leaning into the punches, as you said, and he looks at Cornelius Rather and he says, Really? Is that, is that the best explanation for the persistence of these motifs? Like, how incurious is it? How, how, um, how uh, 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 kind of, uh, not, not quite judgmental, though he could have said judgmental, which sure. is an interesting, um, which is an, you know, he's almost using, in a sense, liberal, almost liberal, uh, uh, sentimental motifs, like we're not supposed to be judgmental and, you know, misread people, you know, right, kind right, of thing. Right, right. Uh, and he's basically saying, um, you know, why, you know, he says that in a couple of paragraphs later, you know, why do they refuse to cut the umbilical cord which binds the living and flourishing child to its more moribund more mother? For if Cornelius is right, Corinius is right, it should be a great relief to them to do so. And yet they don't do so. so. It seems like people persist in having these kind of strange beliefs. And is the best explanation at the end of the day that they're just vestigial as vestigial and they should get rid of them? Uh, or is it that maybe they function in a way that you're not quite recognizing, that they have a staying power that you're unattuned to? Uh, and Corinius and many modern people don't actually entertain this very much. Uh, oddly, interestingly, there's a there's a, a similarity here between uh, the rhetoric of Lewis and uh, 
J. Gresham Machen in uh, Christianity and Liberalism, one mm. of the really interesting moves he makes is he actually accuses the liberal critic of criticizing Christianity. Uh, you know, basically, when they say all these doctrines you can kind of get rid of, you know, basically, and still have something called Christianity. And there's a moment where, where Machen sort of comes off and says something to the effect of, how could you say that? Like, are you actually seeing these people? They're actually in church worshiping this God, and many of them give their lives for these doctrines. And for you to actually kind of come along and say they're just so discardable, like you're not even seeing them. It's actually kind of insensitive. (laughs) And so it's kind of funny. Lewis is doing the same thing. You're kind of using liberal, uh, liberal moral, moral calculus in a way to say like, Hey, you're, you're, you're you're offending your own principles here. (laughs) Right. right, right. (laughs) And I think uh, what was really cool in the way that Lewis progresses is he says, he says, listen, it would be a lot easier for Christians in their social credit to just cut the umbilical cord, right? Like it would be much easier for us if we just gave up uh, what we believed was uh, the, the actual Christi, Christianity that's uh, talked about in the scriptures because we, we get ridiculed for that. We get, Im- and, and a lot of Christians, and I've done this too, Joe, and maybe you've shared some of this sort of uh, sentiment, but there's been, uh, places in my life that I've been surrounded by a group of people that are not Christian and uh, who know that I am Christian that sort of, you know, intentionally make antagonistic remarks against the claims of Christianity to sort of trigger me. And I know that's what's going on. And I feel a need to like sort of show them that I'm not that sort of Christian. Uh, and I feel embarrassed a little bit about my Christian right. faith and some of the claims, like you believe an ax head floated, bro, <laughs> a donkey talked, like you believe a snake slithered up to a woman in a garden, like, right. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, um, and what Lewis is doing is he's saying yes. And actually the reason that Christians are more in tune with reality is because those sort of stories have existed forever. And so what Christians are doing is they're saying, we're recognizing reality. We're not, we are making truth claims, but our truth claims are symbols about something that's real. And these symbols are found in the stories that you can read across the world that have emerged at different times and different places. And they all basically follow the same algorithm. There's yeah. always a deity. There's always, uh, you know, something like sacrifice, self-sacrifice. Uh, there's always a war between virtue and vice, good and evil. Uh, there's always everlasting life in some realm. Uh, there's the theme of resurrection. And uh, that's sort of what Lewis is saying. That's the substance of the Christian faith. And this is one of the reasons that the Christian faith is so persistent. So he, he looks at myth uh, generally, and then he looks at myth as it relates to Christianity more particularly. Right. Uh, so he wants to say, yeah, it would be easier for us if we didn't look so weird to the world when we talk about a man being raised from the dead by a spiritual uh, father. Uh, and that, that resurrection was um, you know, the uh, sign of, perfect righteousness and given to people for the salvation of their sins because they're sinners. Um, In a way, this is Lewis being an evangelical that, uh, well, that's just what Lewis is. Lewis is, Lewis is a, uh, a Christian who's not scared to admit that what he believes to the onlooking world is weird Right. And that that's okay because they're actually believing in something much deeper than propositions that are thrown out about reality. And we'll talk about that. And what he, and what he tries to do in a sense is just say, well, it's weird only to the extent and only in the way that the reality that you ordinarily accomplish is weird. Um, And so one of the uh, uh, fairly soon in the essay, uh, he says, um, obstinacies of this sort are interesting. Why Why not cut the cord, asks Quirinius, 
everything would be much easier if you would free your thought from this vestigial mythology. To be sure, Lewis says, far easier. Life would be far easier for the mother of an invalid child if she put it in an institution and adopted someone else's healthy baby instead. Life would be far easier for many a man if he abandoned the woman he has actually fallen in love with and married someone else because she is more suitable. Right. Now, the only defect of the healthy baby and the suitable woman is that they leave out the patient's only reason for bothering about a child or a wife at all. Right. Uh, and right. he says uh, in letters to Malcolm, he says similar says something quite sim similar uh, uh, where he says something like it's the very nature of the real that's how he puts it there it's the very nature of the real that it actually have hard and jagged edges you know it's only imaginary furniture on which you don't stub your toe as it were mm. you know something like this and he's making a similar case here like if any of this were real this is exactly what you'd expect it to look like. And in fact, if it didn't look this way, if it wasn't weird, if it didn't get to our most Bronze Age primitive lizard brain selves or whatever you want to say it is, then it wouldn't be the real religion that's dealing with a reality that's full of blood, sweat, and tears, and bodies, and water. Uh, yes. You know, all of these motifs that we've been reflecting on for millennia. Uh, and it's precisely, uh, the, the gospel uh, enters precisely into that world. I've just been listening, in fact, to um, Alistair Roberts, who's a, a good friend of both of ours and a, and a friend of our podcast here. And probably uh, he's been a guest before, and I'm sure we'll have him as a guest again. But he's doing this um, this series of um, uh, readings through the scriptures where he reads the Bible in his beautiful Br British accent and then yeah. comments on it. But what's so interesting is Alistair is really attuned to how visceral the language of scripture is and how much, how much mm. the, 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 the kind of, uh, how would I put this, like the, 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 the symbolic traffic of scripture is very much through very visceral language, as, as most traditional human thought has been. It is all about blood and water and families and these sorts of things. And it's in that world that myth you know, which is an ancient form in some ways, uh, but that myth speaks. Nevertheless, it's, um, it's interesting that even in a world where we think we're beyond myth, that myth still shows up. And Lewis was very attuned to this as well. You can't talk about the kind of, how would we put this, the, you know, the sort of the desacralized cosmos or whatnot, you know, the, uh, the, as the cosmos shorn of all personality without re-narrating it in the form of a myth. You know, Richard mm. Dawkins, uh, still has to title books things like uh, The Greatest Show on Earth. Uh, right, right, right. You know, uh, all you've done is sort of emptied the myth and you're, you're, you know, if you want to play this game, your monkey brain still needs to fill it in with something, uh, yes, <laughs> you yes, know, with another yes. myth. Yeah. yeah. Now, now yeah. that just involves genes or whatever is your actors. Yeah. Yes. And I love this, this part because uh, I'll read this here in a second, but what the direction that Lewis goes is he set, he, he starts to chart out for us, which this was one of those profound moments where I was like, that is exactly right. And I've been doing that my whole life and I never even knew it. Mm. Um, and that's the brilliance of Lewis as a man is his ability to sort of, you know, pull all the strings of thought and organize them to where they're not just chaos going, blah, blah, blah. you know, there's, he, 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 he takes the noise of the mind and he had um, the uncanny ability to sort of streamline all the thought where it was, co it's a one coherent uh, way to think. And he says this about sort of um, what it means to actually uh, think about reality and then what it means to be in reality and how these two, uh, these two modes of uh, being um, complement one another, but one is actually tapped into reality in a way that the other one is not. So he says this, he says, pure mathematics is the type of successful thought. Yet the only realities we experience are concrete. This pain, this pleasure, this dog, this man. While we are a loving man, bearing the pain, enjoying the pleasure, we're not actually intellectually app apprehending pleasure 
pain or personality. When we begin to do so, on the other hand, the concrete realities sink to the level of mere instances or examples. We're no longer dealing with them, but with that which they exemplify. And he goes on, this is our dilemma, either to taste and not to know, or to know and not to taste, or more strictly, to lack one kind of knowledge because we are in an experience or to lack another kind because we are outside of it. I mean, come on, man. Like, who thinks that way? So what, what, what I think Lewis is getting at is when you're hanging out with your, with your buddies and you're enjoying your conversation and uh, the joy is just sort of redlined, everybody is completely satisfied with the, the situation, you're feeling the joy of being around brothers and friends that right. deeply love you. What you're not doing at that moment is going, okay, I'm actually in a situation where I have friends and they're doing this and that's making me feel like this and my brain is actually reacting like this to that proposition. You're not, you're not analyzing all the ways in which uh, reality is impeding on your senses that bring you to a conclusion that you should feel this way. You right. just are that way. Right. And that is reality. Yep. And it's only when you step back and begin to explain that phenomena that you're abstracting reality and trying to put uh, words on it to describe something that's true. Right. And Blua says, this is what myth does to us. It, it, it explains situations that we can see and it resonates with us so deeply on an intimate level that we get trapped into the, the uh, particulars of, of the experience to where it's just true because it's just true. Yeah. You know? well, in a sense, I think what he's arguing in that section is that that myth is the kind of in-between space between the experience of the thing and the explanation of the thing in a more abstract way. It's a, it's a, it's a, you, you might say it's incarnate, if you will. Right. Uh, it wraps in an embodied form the abstraction so that we're both kind of, it's accessing our visceral, our kind of visceral embodied whole life uh, and, and capturing us in a particular way that resonates with that being in the moment of the experience. And right. so to talk about those things. And yet it, it nevertheless also has, so it has kind of one foot in that world and it has another foot in the world of nevertheless, it's emotion toward abstraction, not all the way to like, let's talk about the nature of friendship. It's about the story of friendship. And what Lewis is kind of saying, and I, and I think, mm. and this is still true, um, you know, for all the ideological disagreements that we have with, you know, among Christians, with unbelievers, with whatever, one thing that we all share in common to this day is we all watch the same movies. Right. Uh, and we all like a lot of the same movies. And right, there's a reason right, right. for that. And it's interesting. It's a common language of sorts that kind of goes in between the theory and life. Um, and maybe we interpret them as like, well, actually the implications of that story are on our side, you know, that kind of thing, right. all those sorts of debates. But Lewis makes another interesting move here, much along that line where he's sort of saying, so what he does, I think what you just said is right. He, he sort of shows how myth exists in between these two poles. It's not an abstraction and it's also not the experience itself, but it kind of captures us in between those spaces such that, you know, he says you can't study pleasure in the moment of the nuptial embrace. Hopefully right. he's correct about that. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, uh, yeah, uh, but, uh, but right before that, uh, uh, and I think we, we talked about this, you know, before we recorded one of the fun moments in this is, um, uh, where, where he basically says, you're, you're kind of asking us to get rid of myth and then get on board with your ideas. But let's talk about your ideas for a second. All the things you like, Corinius, uh, are things that have existed before and passed away. They're, mm -hmm. not, they're not enduring. You know, the, uh, uh, the, the Gnostics, or he says, the, the monism of Averroes, or, 
on the deism of Voltaire or the dogmatic materialism of the Victorians. All of that stuff is actually passe. Uh, I think, you know, getting with the times, as it turns out, really means failing with the times, passing away with the times. Whereas these kind of mythical motifs that you're considering so primitive, they've stayed the entire time. And it's funny, we're reading this, right? You know, 40, 50, 60 sure. years later. Uh, and it turns out uh, uh, even secular people think about myth a little bit more this way these days. Yes. You know, why is it so enduring? A lot of the study of uh, secular study of religion, in fact, these days is sort of like, what is it about human beings that uh, they really can't quite get rid of this stuff? One of the interesting things along those lines that Lewis is even arguing is that even if you don't go all the way to sort of full-on Orthodox Christianity, it's not surprising for him that myth sort of has staying power even among kind of a, a kind of loose form of Christianity. And so he writes actually toward the end of the essay, and he has a fun word that he adds. He's always, you know, very careful. Yeah. A, a man who disbelieved the Christian story as fact but continually fed on it as myth would perhaps, and he, you know, he's saying perhaps, like hey, maybe not, you know, but perhaps right, right, right. be more spiritually alive than the one who assented and did not think much about it. Um, it's interesting though, you think of somebody like Jordan Peterson here, who yes. maybe very much doesn't, you know, like whether he believes, you know, sort of Christian doctrines or whether these are historical claims or something like that. Nevertheless, he sees a sort of, uh, that, that these images as qua images have a certain kind of purchase on reality that's enduring um, and that has a, um, uh, and, that, and that illuminates life uh, in itself. Uh, Lewis, of course, is going to argue that the two of those go together, the mythical aspect of Christianity and the factual aspect actually come together such that there's something much more powerful here. Um, but nevertheless, the mythical aspect just exists because we're humans and that's how we work. You know, it's just yes. the language, it's the language of reality. Yeah. Yeah, I think Tom Holland does something similar. Um, so Tom Holland is, you know, I he wouldn't be accepted into the membership of evangelical churches, conservative evangelical churches in America. Um, but he has admitted in the same way that Jordan Peterson has that Christianity is so fundamental to the way of life in, West, in the Western world that it's actually ingrained in our DNA. You can't shake it from the way that you operate in reality. And, right. you know, I think that um, there, there is something to, to the idea of sort of like if you take a really sort of narrow-minded, rigid fundamentalist and you put them in a room with a guy like Jordan Peterson or Tom Holland and you have them talk about Christianity, I think that Jordan Peterson or Tom Holland would have a firmer grasp on the substance of what the implications of the teachings of Christ are uh, for us. So it's not just barking uh, proof texts and saying, you know, screaming, repent, uh, right? It's actually explaining the whole, like Peterson's biblical um, uh, series. Did you ever watch any of those? No. Oh, they're good. You should check them out. But he talks about the idea of sacrifice with Cain and Abel. Um, and he, of course, he's coming from a, um, a sort of uh, um, evolution. Uh, he, he's working in the framework of evolutionary psychology. Right. And he's saying that uh, sacrifice, the idea of sacrifice came from humans needing to preserve uh, the animal that they just slaughtered uh, l throughout the week, rather than just killing an animal, stuffing your face, not doing anything with it. So you have a delayed gratification. And then it was like, well, there's these other humans and maybe I can um, maybe I can find sustenance through my relationships with them if I share some of uh, my meal with them. And so I'll delay the gratification of gorging myself and I'll distribute these things I'm sacrificing at this point so I can preserve my community and myself later on down the line. And so he takes this universal principle that he sees show up in um, the story of Cain and Abel and he says, this is what the Bible is saying is just a, a, a story that resonates so deeply with us as a human, because this is just what it means fundamentally to be a human. Right. We 
have these natural impulses. So in a way, what, what, what Lewis is saying in this essay is, uh, my dear friend, uh, your criticisms actually work against you. Uh, because what I'm saying is the most natural way to think about the world. What you're saying is the most unnatural way to look at the world. Because with, if I were to buy into your way of thinking, then I'm just going to move along with the times and my beliefs are not going to reverberate down through history. And, you know, if you just talk about myths and fairy tales in general, there's a reason that we read Peter Rabbit to our children, right? Because it embodies, yeah. it, it, it presents eternal truth in narrative form that's easily digestible to a, to a, hu to a young human uh, to where they can properly orient themselves to the, the, the way that they should move through life. I'm not saying Peter Rabbit is like, you know, up there on the level of the Bible or whatever about course, yeah, yeah. To live. Uh, but that is getting at the phenomena that, uh, that Lewis is talking about here. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, and one of the things, you know, you made this, this comment and I think it's right. Like, um, you know, if you were to internalize the principles of, uh, Quirinius, uh, who's, who's Lewis's foil here. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's a piece of, apparently a piece of humanity and human, human activity that you would just not know what to do with. And yet what's interesting, again, is that um, all of these motifs in their own way still show up. And one of the things I think would be interesting to look at modern civilization, it's a question I'm interested in, and people do work like this, but um, uh, is how do all of these old motifs, you know, take something like sacrifice, take something like the dying and rising God myth, take something like um, uh, trusting God or, or uh, you know, the foundations of community or whatever, all these functions that myth is playing uh, uh, or, or cosmogony or whatever. And then you look at kind of modern uh, 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 sort of atrophied, uh, you know, sort of sort of moral imagination or whatnot, or just just sort of historical imagination, and all these things still exist. I mean, I mean, it's hard for me not to look at this point at something like the abortion industry. Uh, I mean, I mean, how much could you look at the abortion industry as a um, as a form of modern sacrifice? Uh, on the altar of a god yes. and it seems to me actually that that's th not only a way to look at it it seems to me like it's the only coherent way to look at it ultimately if you really see how that functions within the whole of our civilization how it functions relative to a whole communal value system it appears to me that this is the sacrifice that we make on the altar of a god uh, yes. whatever that god is um, and you could go through all those other motifs, you know, where do, where does, where do redemptive motifs show up? Where does our cosmogony show up that informs us about who we are? How do we create narrative historical stories? You know, tell us, you know, we're still primitive. Right, right, <laughs> like, right, like right. that's the funny thing about it is that at the yes. end of the day, um, and of course, if you just walk around for, for any given day and just observe what you do with your body in the weird gestures you make toward other people and notice your weird need to touch others when you relate to them or whatever it is, uh, you know, just weird old things that you do that you don't even quite understand why you do them. That's just life. And Lewis, in a sense, is just saying like, you're really, you're, you're just embarrassed. You're, 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 in a way, what he's what he's doing with Quirinius is telling a a, a, a proper British intellectual, uh, you're embarrassed about certain intellectual motifs, in the same way that some people are embarrassed that they just have bodies, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, and that that and the, and that the, what bodies do is pretty embodied. And that's what yeah. myths do as well, and that's kind of how he transitions toward the end of the essay, um, is that myth. Myth, in a way, is this thing that's in between the experience itself and the, um, uh, and the abstraction. But he says, uh, uh, as myth transcends thought, and this is where he goes to his sort of Christian direction, right? As myth transcends thought, incarnation transcends myth. The heart of Christianity is a myth, which is also a fact. Right. The old myth of the dying God, without ceasing to be myth comes down from the heaven of legend in a matter
imagination to the earth of history. It happens at a particular date in a particular place, followed by a definable historical circumstance. And then he goes on later, to, uh, to be truly Christian, one must, we must both assent to the historical fact and also receive the myth, fact though it has become, uh, with the same imaginative embrace that we accord to all myths. Uh, and so now it's sort of like this is the language. Myth is the la- myth is commentary uh, on the on the on the language in which God has written reality. Yes. Uh, and the historic myth is God's own. Uh, <laughs> that's it's human commentary would be a better way to say that. Uh, and then and then this is actually divine commentary in a way uh, through becoming history through actually becoming a fact you know the the true myth basically yeah it's heaven comes down the myth of heaven comes down and is uh, born in the virgin uh, in the incarnate son of Christ this is where the myth and the fact uh, actually find their expression in history right um, you know I think I think that perhaps some of the hesitation as we're wrapping up here, yeah. I want to, I want to deal with some of maybe the hesitation of what Lewis is saying by, um, uh, you know, good Christians that believe yeah. in, their, in their Bibles and confessions is that it's like what you're talking about sounds odd because you're, you're using words like imagination. You're using words like myth. You're tying that into the Christian story And it would be good to remind everyone that imagination is not some appendage that Hank, that is, you know, sort of grew on our, our mind like a tumor after the fall. And we need to stifle what our imagination is doing when we encounter reality. Um, Because once we make that move, we're on the road towards a really uh, dark place where you can only discern what is good, true, and beautiful by clear statements of what is right and what is wrong. Because most of life, we don't have a grid that we can use to discern what is right and what is wrong. And that's why uh, the Bible is so rich with wisdom literature. Um, Wisdom is knowing how to act in any particular circumstance in accord with the natural design of the cosmos uh, with a recognition that God, um, you know, wants us to operate in that, in, in those, and, and um, Lewis even says it here, don't be nervous about parallels that you might find between, say, right. uh, you know, Islam and Christianity and Judaism and Hinduism and Buddhism. Don't be nervous that you see parallels there, because uh, that's all speaking to one, one truth. Now, of course, we would say that Christianity is the clearest expression of the myth. Uh, we actually find that uh, in Christ. Well, yeah, it just is the myth in a way. Like for us, it is not, not the, it's, it's the fact. It's uh, the fact know, and yeah. everything else is a derivation of that. Yes. Right, right. right. Yep. And so we shouldn't be afraid to use our God-given imaginations to interpret reality. Uh, you know, in, in, in some way, God gave it to us precisely to do that. Right. Uh, and it's those that can tap into that in healthy ways um, that will grow in wisdom. And it will be an organic growth of wisdom. This will help you when you shepherd your children or when you deal with your wife or when you have relationships. Uh, because the only other, not the only other way, that's um, the wrong way to say it, but an alternative way is to approach everything like, okay, I have all of these things. This is a very rigid system. You must believe this. And if you don't believe this, then we can't get along. Yeah. Well, that's going to break down community. And yeah. it denies the uh, diversity that God has given his creatures uh, in terms of intellectual capacity and um, uh, instinct right. and, and all of these things. So I think what Lewis is doing, he's giving us a big spoonful of medicine uh, against our uh, rigid impulses to be fundamentalist. And he's, and he's saying, it's okay to use your imagination, Christian, because guess what? It all works in our favor. And one of the things Lewis points out about that um, is that 
the very fact that Christianity is in that uh, accesses so much of that space it accounts for its capacity to speak to everyone. Because if it's all about algorithms, if the moral life and the theological life are mostly about sort of algorithmic knowledge, um, then really what you have done is you have um, seeded Christianity to the most powerfully computing minds, yeah. you know, sort of internet theology nerds. That's who right, gets Christianity. Right. Right. And, and in fact, that's exactly how he ends. Uh, he ends with thanking Corinius, Cur Cur uh, which is funny. <laughs> right, right. Thanks for reminding us that Christianity is in fact a myth. It's also yeah. a fact, but it's also good to remind us that it's a myth. Right. So I uh, love his love the way he, he, he spars, you know, just creative. Um, but he ends with, uh, for this is the marriage of heaven and earth, perfect myth and perfect fact, perfect myth and perfect fact, claiming not only our love and our obedience, but also our wonder and delight addressed to the savage, the child, and the poet, in each one of us, no less than to the moralist, the scholar, and the philosopher. And so, yeah, it's written <laughs> in a way that the, you know, the, the story is something the child can grasp. That's, yeah. that's the power of these things. And it's why it's so enduring. And it's so enduring because there's something childlike that remains in the wise man. This is, in fact, all philosophical traditions recognize this, that there's an, a childlike openness that remains, remains in the wise man. Uh, and so, yeah, this is a, yeah, it's a, a, just a great piece of Lewis. And of course, it's some distinctive themes that he, he has all over the place. He has this wonderful line as well. If God chooses to be mythopoeic, uh, that is sort of writing the world in the language of myth, uh, and it is not, and is not the sky itself a myth, Lewis says, <laughs> right, shall right. we refuse to be mythopathic? meaning sort of receptive to the language of myth, if this is the language in which reality is written. And what you said, Dale, I think there's a, there's a lot of things to say there, you know, like how does this actually, uh, understanding the world this way uh, help us uh, in, in, a, in a larger way? Some of it is just like, this is actually, it is a, a culture that thinks this way to which most of the Bible's written. And so part of it is it just actually helps you read the Bible more clearly. The Bible yes. is dealing with the, lang the visceral language of, of blood. You know, I, I think Al Alistair again points out, it's so interesting. Um, very often when the New Testament talks about redemption, it's not the death of Christ. It does mention that, but it's the blood of Christ. It's more, it's a, it's, it's a layer more visceral than that. That's the world's blood and water. All of these things are actually designed by God to teach us, to speak to us. And there's something about the uh, modernity where we kind of lost the imagination and the connection to these visceral realities such that they speak to us. And I think what Lewis is doing is in some ways with his discourse on myth, in fact, mediating to us a set of categories to kind of remember uh, what it was like to have that visceral contact with the, with the text of the world <laughs> in which God has written himself and therefore to be able to see how then the, the Christian story becomes a fact in that real world of blood, sweat, and tears and illuminates it and guides us. So, yeah. yeah and I think um, um, just one last thing and then we'll wrap up. But, yep. uh, you know, he does something similar uh, in Miracles, which you did a series on uh, for um, Pilgrim Faith. Or no, that was the series for the Davenant uh what was Academy. It? The Davin Academy. Right. Maybe, maybe you should link that too in the show notes on YouTube. Yeah. Sure. Uh, because I think it's just brilliant. You did a really good job with that. Thanks. Um, but he does something similar when he's talking about reason. And he says, in a way, reason is a miracle in itself. God actually has to be the agent back of reason, sort of like inspiring reason to, to operate. Right. And uh, that's sort of getting into the mechanics of the world. And, uh, and so you start to see themes of the way that Lewis thinks. And, and with that, I, so this will be, um, I suppose, this will probably be the first episode of a series that we want to do on uh, the works of Lewis. Yep. And we've got some great guests lined up to talk about it. Um, so stay tuned for that. And Maybe we'll mark this in a particular way on YouTube and in the podcast, we'll figure out how to do that. Even if we can't do it for this one, we'll figure it out moving yep. forward. 
Um, but so stay tuned. We'll, we're going to have lots more to talk about in, in, in the way of Lewis. Um, and please, guys, if you enjoy the conversation, you can subscribe on iTunes. You can follow us on YouTube. Uh, we have a, a Facebook page and a Facebook group where you can sort of get into the conversation if you'd like with Joe and I. Uh, and we'll link that too. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we'll also have our Kindful accounts link there. So if you think that this is a ministry worthy of your financial support, uh, please show that support uh, in any way that you can. We're happy for anything. Um, and if you can't su support us financially, if you think the project is worthy of support, pray for us. Uh, so yeah. thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time. All right. Uh, thanks, Dale. Love you, brother. And we'll, love you too. Uh, we'll see you again next time. All right, brother.